Next section is human error. And what we're finding now, that's our biggest challenge across the planet, across industry. We'll see shortly that uh, the engineering and the science, we've pretty well got that sorted. The, the big unknown, the big remaining area to control is, is people. And people are interesting because people have choices. The thing with reliability and, and the fortunate thing is we're dealing with machines. Machines uh, are designed to live within certain parameters and all we have to do is sustain those parameters and the machine is healthy. So reliability is basically fairly straightforward because the machine, what it needs, we know that. We simply provide what the machine needs. When it comes to people, they aren't machines. They are um, independent. They have their own view of situations and they're very variable. And people, of course, that variation makes us what we are, makes it the fun it is to, to, to be involved with people. But it also means when it comes to looking after machinery, that variation leads to problems. And we'll see some examples of that coming up. The sort of things that we do to our machines, uh, perhaps unintentionally, but nonetheless, that's the result. We'll twist them, squeeze them, hit them, poison them, as in contamination. Uh, burn them, overheat them, we shake them, we break them, we choke them, we overload them, we will boil them. Yeah. Here, cavitation, we will boil our machines. None of which has to happen. It wasn't part of the design, it wasn't never intended to be that way, but that's what happens. So we want to control this. If we can control this and control our engineering and science, then these problems go away because these are the results of something being done to overstress the item and the stress fails that part. So if I can stop that stress occurring from whatever reason it occurs, then I am in control of reliability. Some of this stuff is actually out of the aircraft industry, and this is an example of the sort of things that they've worked hard on. When you look at a company like Boeing and the items they make, the planes they make, or Airbus in Europe, when you buy a Boeing aircraft, you also get a stack of manuals, this high, perhaps even higher. And the way um, the industry works is you maintain the aircraft exactly as the manufacturer of the aircraft tells you to, ma to maintain it. Reason being is they know the engineering, they know the metallurgy, they know the design they use to, main to build that craft. They know how best to maintain that craft. So if I have 100,000 aircraft technicians around the world working on Boeing aircraft in India, in Japan, in America, in Australia, these 100,000 guys only have one manual because it's the Boeing manual. You maintain Boeing aircraft exactly the way Boeing wants you to maintain it. And all these guys are trained to do it the Boeing way on Boeing aircraft. They're certified. They've gone through rigorous training, certified against a particular requirement, a particular standard, and they maintain a particular model of aircraft all their career, or they're retrained to maintain a different model. So what Boeing have done is they've created a process of having very tight outcomes. If I gave 100,000 technicians the right to go and maintain aircraft as they want and say, guys, here's my aircraft, can you maintain it, please? If they do it 100,000 different ways, I will naturally get thousands of different outcomes for the same solution. But Boeing don't say that. Boeing's saying, you maintain my aircraft just the one way, the way that we tell you. And in doing that, what Boeing have done is create a process ensuring high quality performance every single time. Now planes still fall out of the sky, so that process is not yet perfect, but it's a lot better than it was 20 years ago, a lot better than it was 50 years ago, and they're always refining, always improving. So that philosophy of Boeing and Airbus to have a one only way to maintain and operate an aircraft, no matter who you are in the world, produces the reliability that we now enjoy in air, in air flight. That logic is sound, it works, it can be improved. And that's the logic we should apply in every industry because it gives us one outcome, a known outcome every single time. Now, of course, in industry, general industry, we're unlucky because we aren't regulated. The aircraft industry and nuclear industry are lucky because they have regulations that tell the owners they must maintain the equipment to a certain level of reliability. And they are forced by law to do the right thing. The right thing produces the right result. General industry, there's no law as to how to maintain a pump. We'll do it as we think. So in our machines um, that are made of many parts, we're in a situation like this. This particular machine or item is nine parts, one way only to build it. 
and more than 40,000 40, ways to, to build it incorrectly. And our machines have more than nine parts. And we have hundreds of parts. So we have much opportunity to, do, to make some serious misunderstandings, thinking of course that it's right. We're not building this thing wrong on purpose. We're building it in a way we think is right, except of course it's not right because it wasn't done the right way in the first place. Just want to pop out of here and go into our workbook and talk about a particular cause of failure. Let me just get that onto the page. The very first section of this workbook is, a, is three articles or extracts from three articles across the, um, the area of, of human error. I just want to read this. It's interesting to, to see what it's saying. Many managers and engineers believe most failures have a root cause in the equipment. Data from nuclear power plants, which maintain a culture of confessing failures and the roots of failures, uh, in opposition to most industries where the culture is to hide the roots of failures, show us the following causes uh, of failure. Early in the life of the nuclear power plant, we find that the, the failures, when we look at the, the causes of failures, come down to these categories here. Design errors represent 35% of early life failures in nuclear power plants. Now, these aren't calculation errors. This is uh, errors made by such things as material selection, uh, misunderstanding of operational service and buying the, right, the wrong machine for that particular job. Just, um, I guess, lack of knowledge type errors. 35% are, are design errors. 80% of the errors of component failures are actually to do with the process applied and the procedures that the business works under cause those failures. When it comes down to operating error, the people and procedural problems cause 12% of operating errors. Same thing with maintenance errors, that the people or the procedures used are, are causing the failures. The procedures, of course, are written documents that the company has approved for use. There were 12% unknown, which we had no explanation for. Known errors in procedures was 10% of the problem, and fabrication errors was 1% of the problem. 88% of early life failures in nuclear power plants are either people or business process caused. As the plant matures and they solve those commissioning problems, it comes down to 72% are either people or business process. Nothing to do with the machines, people or business process. Next one down is uh, from the ASME, American Society of Maintenance Engineers uh, Decade Report. The next one's due out next year in 2012, but it'll be the same story as they had in 2002. For the 10 years between 92 and, and 01, 127 people died from boiler and pressure vessel accidents, 720 people were injured, there were 23,000 plus accidents uh, reported. 43, uh, not, sorry, 83% direct result of human oversight or lack of knowledge. Same reasons were listed for 69% of the injuries, 60% of the recorded deaths. Human oversight and lack of knowledge kills people. Uh, and the final one is at the bottom there, from uh, an extract from a book on reliability engineering. A major challenge to reliability theory was recognised, and the theoretical val probabilities of failure were compared with actual rates of failure. And natural rates instead of the theoretical values by factors of 10 or 100 and more than the calculations advised. They identified the main reason for the discrepancy to be that the theory of reliability employed did not consider the effect of human error. Human error Anticipating failure continues to be the single most important factor in keeping the reliability of engineering designs from achieving the theoretically high values made possible by modern methods of analysis and materials. Nothing wrong with our machines, nothing wrong with our engineering, nothing wrong with our science. The problem is our business processes are lousy and our people, you and I and everybody else, don't know enough about what the right thing to do is. And this is what we're finding is the challenge for us now. Again, aircraft industry, because when people make mistakes in aircraft industry, many people die. They've had a, look, a, a big look at this, and there's a, a lot of work being done by aircraft industry, which I've simply grabbed to, and, and show how it's real and, and put into, uh, into perspective what's happening in general industry. What we know is technically, engineering-wise, very few accidents are, are from those areas there. 80% of the accidents have human factor type issues involved, including uh, lousy business processes. Instructions that, that don't explain things properly, that confuse people, that ha don't have information that's vital to understand. And here's our figures from those that previous presentations and previous extracts I mentioned. So 
80% plus of our problems are business process and human. So if I'm going to try and improve a company, I go in and work in the machinery. The machinery are suffering because of us and our lousy business processes. If I'm going to improve a company, I want to work on the processes and the people. If I can get the processes improved and lift the people up to understand more and, and appreciate things more, I'm going to get the results that, that we want. So in plant and equipment wellness, in the plant wellness way, it's about understanding where the focus has got to be. Education is going to be a big player. Very good, clear instructions, good procedures, people trained to the procedure. This morning, when we broke that paper clip, you know, once I began having one way and one way only to, to break clips, our distribution came right down to very controllable areas. So same here, if I have a procedure that is well written, clear, everybody's taught to follow it, then I can guarantee the outcomes, because that's what Boeing done. Boeing has guaranteed the outcomes of their procedure for maintenance and flying aircraft. They've controlled the training, the knowledge, the practices, the procedures to guarantee a certain result. And that's the thinking that we try and adopt in the plant wellness way. So in plant wellness, one of the first things we're going to do is understand why things fail, discover what causes that in a company, and then change their documentation to include the prevention of that failure. So we're going to be a lot of documentation revised because that's where the trouble is. It's going to be people not knowing and documents that are useless to us that don't know. And that again, I didn't realise till only a few years, and a couple of years ago. I would have been an engineer and worked on the machine and done an RCA on the machine and put RCA through the whole company and everybody learns RCA. And still the machines keep on breaking and breaking and breaking because they have missed the whole issue. They're being broken by the company's practices and the lack of knowledge in the people. That's why they're breaking. So I've got to solve that problem. And um, then the machines improve. Now, third. Would RCA just not ever <coughs> identify this? Would it just miss it? Yes, it would miss the global impact of this. What tends to happen with an RCA is they will find the problem and very often it'll go back to the procedure failure. Now, oh, let's write a new procedure, which they write a procedure for this one problem. What they, it'll miss is that every machine is in the same risk. Now, one procedure's been improved, but if you've got 100 procedures and, none of, and 99 weren't improved, but only one was improved, then you know, it's not much change, really, in, in the business. It's a very small fraction out of, out of a huge possibilities. So we intentionally go in and look for problems and, and imagine problems and look where the risk is. And if the risk is too big, we go back and improve the procedure and retrain the people in the correct practices. Then I adopt the Boeing way. I adopt the Boeing philosophy. And that forces me to change my business process outcomes to the ones that I want. And in doing that, of course, all this money that I've lost, all this money here, I don't lose it anymore. Because you know? this is all lost money. Now that money stays in the business. And that's where this thinking goes. This is why, in the end, it's going to be a paper-based step-through process. But if we, design our, if we design our process correctly, the process outcomes are also guaranteed, which will be high reliability, high uptime, high profitability, high availability, you know, all the things that businesses are looking for. The trouble, of course, is, or the challenge, I guess not so much trouble, the challenge is we're dealing with people. It's, it's human factors. All of us are different. You know, we've got different shapes and, and, and physical abilities. Our psychological aspects are all different, all varied, depending upon our, our previous experiences. Our physiological is different and that affects the way our, our, our brains work and, so, and psychosocial as well. There's a whole bunch of factors that the aircraft industry realises they have to manage. And of course now pilots have been for a long time, they're every, on a regular basis, they're physically checked. Go to the doctors, same with the mechanics working on the aircraft, they're physically checked. Are they, are they still competent to do their job both mentally and, and in their skills? Because we're trying to build a process that delivers the same results every single time. And we're dealing with people who are hugely variable and don't really want to change people. It's going to be impossible to change people. What we're going to do is build a process that allows people to be people, but the failures are, do not then result into, in, into uh, breakdowns of machines. So I don't want to be looking at, um, at blaming people. It, it, 
we are doing the best we can. We all are, we're all doing that. But if my business process is a lousy process that allows human error to multiply and to, to, to magnify, then I've got to, I want to change the process first. In the aircraft industry, the, the, the dirty dozen is, is the 12 areas that they're focusing very hard on to try and improve and control the, the impact of people on their business. A lot of research done in this, a lot of data on the internet, um, two or three day courses on this particular area as well. But the 12 key things is lack of communication. Literally, you know something that you should have told me, but you never did because the opportunity to communicate never came up. And what's happening now in the aircraft industry is the maintenance mechanics and the pilots are now being forced to go into a room together. Each partner has a set of questions they ask each other, write the answers down. So the aircraft industry has put a process into place to force guys to talk on particular key points that make planes safe to fly. So that's how we build a process to make communication happen in a company. We actually ask people the question face to face, write down what they say so that we actually hear correctly what we think they said because what you say and what I hear and what I think are three different things. I've got to make sure that what I write is what you meant and so I get the right information. So yeah, communication and, and passing on what we know is, is vital. Teamwork. You know, teams, when you look at how a team operates, we help each other. You know, if I'm weak in one area, my buddy comes along and, and, and lifts me up and strengthens me by giving me his support in my weak area. So you want to have teamwork across the company and across departments because where I'm strong, I'll add value. Where someone else is strong, they'll add value to me. So I want to have teamwork because of the benefit teamwork brings. When you think about what teamwork actually is in terms of reliability, there's me alone. There's number one guy, number two guy, and on we go. What I've done here in terms of, of process outcomes, I have actually linked the three of us in parallel. In our reliability thinking, logically, once we're in a team, we're working off each other. He supports, I support him, he supports me, this guy supports the, the, us too as well. So reliability-wise, we're actually creating uh, parallel activities and parallel people. As a consequence, of course, the team output is a better outcome. So the teamwork, that's why we want to have it, because as a team, we'll produce better results globally than one person alone. I can't know it all. He can't know it all. Look and he. But he knows things I don't know. He knows things that, that we don't know. The three of us together, we can do more and we know more as a team. So yeah, teamwork makes a lot of sense. There's serious money in teamwork, serious good benefits. Norms, of course, is company culture. And that'll be what's been inbred through misunderstanding across the years in the past. And uh, we've got to challenge that because most of our problems we cause ourselves. Pressure literally is production want this machine back. So I'll do a four hour job in two hours. You do a four hour job in two hours, there's only one way to do that. I'm going to take shortcuts. I take shortcuts, then of course I'm going to have the payback from that very shortly. Complacency literally is, uh, I don't really give a damn. I'm just here for the money is an example, you know. Oh gee, it's nearly time to go home. I'll just leave this one go. I'll, no, I'll take a, take a, do this in a, in a fast way to get it done before I've got to go home and wash up. Lack of knowledge literally is that not knowing and not knowing we don't know. That's a bit, you know. Conscious um, ignorance, I guess, or unconscious ignorance. Lack of resources or lack of awareness. This is an awareness of, of what I'm doing and its consequences and how to do it properly. What is the right way to get the right result? Now, I'll, I can maintain a car. You give me a car to maintain and I'll maintain it. I can work my way through. I'll do it this way and I'll do it that way. What I don't understand is by doing it that way, what the impact will be in the coming time that car's in service. Lack of resources literally is not having the manpower, the skills, the equipment, the machinery, the measuring devices to do the job properly. Distraction, we are flesh and bone. We are beings whose brains can get attracted by other, other activities. If last night I had a big fight with my wife and I come to work this morning, what's on my mind will not be work, it will be about the big fight with my wife because I know that no, there's a disruption in the family. So distraction will be what happened last night. 
might be what someone does um, in, in the workspace that's a bit crazy and, and my mind focuses on that and away from the job I'm actually on. So when I go back to the job, uh, I may have missed a whole step out but thought I was actually in the right place. Assertiveness is the willingness or the courage to see, to speak up when something is wrong. If you watch somebody do up some fasteners and they didn't use a torque wrench and you know they should use a torque wrench, he's having the gumption to say, look, it's not my job, I understand that, but look, the procedure talks, uh, it requires you to have a torque wrench and I, I, I didn't see you using that. Uh, are you going to do it the way the procedure says? Having that, that courage to say that. Fatigue is that. Our brain tires, our muscles tire. As we get older, we'll tire even faster. And stress, once things are stressful, uh, our brain blinkers. If we're under too much stress, the, um, the, uh, the way our brain works is we'll actually be, begin to worry and begin to focus on getting rid of that stress, escaping the, the, the issues. And, and so uh, we don't begin to see other opportunities that would have been good solutions. We just come right down and blinker ourselves. So it's worth knowing about these because in, in, in plant wellness, if we're going to have, uh, can, we're going to help people to become better, then we're going to have to front all of these. We're going to have to approach these as human being with human being. Um, it's there. It's never going to go away. Until we become robots and they put us into a robotic body with a human with a brain, it's never going to be any different to, to the way it's been for 10,000 years. So I can't walk away from the fact that we won't change. We've got to then find answers that allow us to be humans but then don't break our machines. Again, something I never actually found before, and I'm going to bring this up uh, a lot larger shortly, is the human error rate table. This actually comes from a reliability engineering book that's been around for a few years now. And it is the average of human error rate across industry, across the world. It's a number that represents a, a typical situation. Now, every company is different, every person is different, every situation is different. So that number will be different depending upon the circumstances, but it's indicative. So I want to stick with this as an indicative representation of what it means in terms of human error rate and the effect of, on human error. And of course, uh, the, the whole point of this is to find some answers, to minimise human error, because we saw before that human error, uh, uh, human error leads to 10 to 100 times greater failure rate than had there been no human error. So let me bring this up so I can read it uh, together with you. Okay. Just have a read of what this table says. <coughs> so we have here human error rates of, uh, in the order of 1 in 10,000. So for example, read a five letter word with good resolution wrongly, 3 in 10,000. Let me just explain that so that we get the numbering right. So 0 0.0003 is the same as saying 3 over 10,000. So in 10,000 times of doing, uh, of reading a five letter word with good resolution wrongly, three times we'll read that word, think it's something else, but think it's still right. We'll misread and think it's right 3 in 10,000. Not very often, but it happens. Uh, another one here, select wrong switch, the mimic diagram. So I've got a diagram of the switch panel. I'll get that wrong, 5 in 10,000. Not very often, but that switch is one that leads to a failure. Then every now and again, I'm going to get throw the wrong switch and it'll, it'll lead to a breakdown. Uh, fail to notice crossroads. Fail to notice major crossroads, 5 in 10,000. There's a story of a truck driver in Australia who was driving between two country towns. They were doing a construction in one of the country towns and taking the, the, the dirt on this tip truck to another country town to get rid of that dirt. And between the two country towns, there was a railway. And for many, many months, this truck driver would go from the construction site to another country town, dozens of times a day. And every time he'd go across the railway, no train, no train, no train, day after day, week after week, month after month. One day, there was a train. He hit it. Five people died. And what happened was he didn't see it. Because for hundreds of times on that section of road up here in his brain, no train. So in his brain, his brain had said, well, this section of road, there's never a train. There's not going to be no train today. Unfortunately, there was a train today. And this is how we get it wrong. Yeah? Things that we see repetitively are not a problem. 
if there's a change, our brain doesn't see the change. It just accepts it was like it was the last 10,000 times or 110 times. Uh, and in this case, five people did. Now I'm noticing as I'm getting older, this is happening more to me. I'm actually going to kitchen, to fridge doors to put my shoes away in the cupboard. I'm thinking, hey Mike, what's happening here? It's because up in my brain, I have got a, a groove. My brain has created a, an arrangement of neurons and signals that when I go to this white door, it is a cupboard. It happens to be a fridge white door and I open up the fridge to put my shoes in. And then of course it twigs. This is how we're designed. Our brain's designed to simplify things down to the bare basic processes and then make it a habit. Now I'll drive home and I can drive and then not even think about how I got home. I went through all the lights, I turned left, right, here, there and there. How did I get home? Up here, our brain has got a set of arranged neurons and it just follows that rule. And this is what happens with older people. Anyone, to me, anyone older than 50, you've got to watch out that which groove are they on today. If they're in the wrong groove, they'll just go automatically, not even think about it. And that's human nature. Has been, always will be. And we can be smart enough to realise that. So maybe for old guys that are 50, maybe I better give them a buddy. You know? Me, 56, I better get Fred here. Fred, he's 35. Fred, just check on me every now and again, make sure I haven't made a mistake. Uh, and I did that on purpose. I buddy Fred up with me because of this situation here. The way we are designed as, as animals and human beings, our brain works that way and we can never change it. So every now and again we'll get caught out. Now that was simplest possible task. Then we go down to routine simple task. So read a checklist or digital display wrongly, ah, one in a thousand. So we've gone from one in 10,000 range to one in a thousand range. Another one down here, wrongly carry out visual inspection for a defined criterion. So go and look for a leak on this valve or this machine, whatever the case is. Though I'm told exactly what to do, I will get it wrong on average three and a thousand times. Um, Fail to correctly install, replace PCB. My instrumentation tech or my electrician pulls a motherboard out of a, out of a PLC program, a machine, puts a new motherboard in, and he thinks he's got it in right, but in fact, um, four in a thousand times, it's actually wrong. And that's just the nature of the beast. We, we do a job, we think it's right, in fact, we have not gone the next step to confirm it is right. Then across to the other side of the page, we are into a uh, routine task with care needed. For example, uh, mate, a connector wrongly. I've got two hose fittings, I've got to put them together and they'll be done wrongly one in a hundred times. So we're getting to the situation now where it's happening more often and some of these things are getting tricky to do as well. What's another one there? Do simple arithmetic wrongly one, to a, one in a hundred to, to three in a hundred times. So if your technician has got some mathematics to do in his, in his instructions in his work task, and he does the mathematics wrongly, um, then if I have 100 technicians, then I can guarantee one guy at least will have got that particular calculation wrong. And if the calculation is wrong and he puts that number into his program or into his, calc into his calibrations, then that's now going to go wrong as well, all because of this particular risk of, uh, of mathematics being done incorrectly. Interesting one down here. Read five letter word with, with poor resolution wrongly. Three and a hundred. So as things get hard for our brain to, to pick up on, we start making more mistakes. It begs the question, for example, um, if here we have read five letter word with poor resolution wrongly, it's three and a hundred. Three and a hundred. And back here, we saw read five letter word with good resolution wrongly, three in 10,000. And the only difference is resolution. What should I do with my procedures? What should, how, how should I present information to my guys? Because if they can't read it very well, what's the mistakes? If I can make it clear, easy, obvious, colour, bolding, lots of white space, I then create a situation where the error rate goes, goes right down. And this is a choice that maintenance planners have to make. Now, when maintenance planners put together their procedures, their documentation, what's the smallest sized font you should have in documentation going to operators and maintainers? Because if they can't read it, they're not going to start making mistakes. 
So what I said to my guys in my maintenance planning course, I asked the question, what's the smallest resolution you should have on your documents? Because I can actually create high reliability by having you know, information easy to read. Normally you settle about 12 point font. Nothing smaller than a 12 point font in documentation going to maintainers. I'd be happy with a 14 point font because it says so here. If the guys can read things clearly and it's easily to resolve with their eyes, they will make less mistakes than if they can't resolve it. Their brain will make up the words. And there's a hundred times less failure in having good documentation. Easy to read. Our, our brain loves colour. Colours, imagery. So less and less words, more and more pictures. Clear pictures and the picture be becomes something our brain latches on very, very quickly. We, we love visual information. So this, um, this table here has some very interesting outcomes for us to use. Another one here, put 10, digit, 10 digits into a calculator wrongly, five in a hundred times. How many guys have misdialed the phone number? You've all dialed the wrong numbers over the years? Happens all the time. It's just, it's just the nature of, of being human beings. Now we get into the situation of maintainers. Now we're into the um, complicated non-routine task area. And here the failure rates are typically one in 10. So when things get complicated and non-routine as maintaining machinery is, our machines are very involved engineering devices and, this, and we don't do this sort of work all, all the time, day in, day out. Now we're down to a situation where we have a real serious risk. Uh, Fellow recognise incorrect status in a roving inspection, one times in 10. So if I have a work order and it is to go and inspect the plant for problems, I'm going to walk past one problem in 10 because my brain doesn't pick it up. And that's just the nature of the beast. If I add stress on top of that, as in environmental stress or, uh, or stress from unrealistic expectations, I go up to 0.25. So the guys that tell you they work best under stress, so I love stress, I work the best. Bull dash, bull dash, not true. Because stress makes our brain blinker. We're going to escape the animal chasing us, you know, the beast behind us in the jungle that was chasing us through the trees. That's stress. And our brain, brain blinkers right down to escape one pathway, not multiple pathways. One that really scared me when I first saw it was the very last one. Failed to act correctly after one minute in the situation, nine times out of ten. Two minutes into this Mitchell situation, everything goes wrong. So in maintenance, we don't want to have our guys in emergency situations. Because in an emergency situation, we do not think straight. We are not built to think straight in high risk situations. So maintenance, if it comes a, a high risk, high, um, high stress scenario, where things are done in emergency, uh, emergency environments, then things are going to go wrong automatically. Because we just don't see all the options available to us. To me, this table actually is interesting because it gives us an answer of what we need to do. It says over here with a sigma rate is one, a failure rate of one in 10, which is a sigma rate of, of two to three sigma. To go from complicated non-routine task to routine task with care needed to routine simple task to simplest possible task. We go from one in 10 to one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000. Make things simple. Keep things very, very clear, very, very obvious. And the table tells you what's going to happen. You're going to get less troubles. Now, these numbers here, just going to show you a couple of things more about what the table's actually telling us. This number two. Fail to recognise incorrect status on a roving inspection. So if I have a work order that's a roving inspection, I have an error rate here in the range of, what is that, uh, one in ten. But we saw before, if I then go in and convert my work order to a defined criterion, so wrongly carried a visual inspection for a defined criterion, it now becomes three in a thousand. So I've gone from one in 10 chance of error to three in a thousand chance of error simply by introducing defined criterion. Go and inspect for this and inspect for that, and inspect for this one, inspect for that one. Very clearly. So I now develop a checklist, as it says up here. Red checklist, digital display wrongly, one in a thousand times. If I define exactly what to look for, then I am creating a high reliability situation. 
So my documentation now is valuable to me. If I create a process where I have defined criteria, look for these things, if it's not there, then report. If it is there, great, carry on. I actually, the table says to me, I will produce reliability. I'll produce a far better outcome and, and far fewer human error um, effects. So this table is very valuable. I, I wish I had a bigger one. I've been looking for a more and more uh, table with, with more of this information because it's telling us what to do. You know? From one in 10 to three in a hundred, or sorry, to three in a thousand, just by writing good documentation that's easy to read with defined things to look for. Now, of course, that means my documents are going to be thicker. Of course. I'm asking guys to, I'm going to be writing with bigger text, more pictures, and asking them to look for specifically these 25 things. So I'm going to have more documentation. Is it worth it? No. Is um, a thousand times less mistakes, or a hundred times less mistakes worth it? Your risk matrix will soon make it clear if it's going to be worth it or not. Now, another thing too that's changing technologically wise is paper will be replaced shortly with things like iPads and things like handheld computers. So when I've got that technology, then it doesn't matter how long the paper is because it's going to be electronic and I can have um, immediate feedback to my BLC, you know, wireless connection. So technology is going to take all this into a, a tool that will very quickly let us interact with our database and feed our raw data from the um, inspection directly back into our analysis packages and tell people within 30 seconds that, hey, this is not what we, things are changing. Something's um, out of place or something's, uh, something's having a, a problem in, in its operation. So as a manager, if I'm not aware of the impact of human error on my operation, I would never go and look at using those sort of tools. I would never think about, hey, you mean a piece of paper will create this situation for me with a decent documentation and some, and some simple checklists? Yeah. You start using checklists with defined criteria, you will create that situation. And nothing else has to change. But of course, somebody has to write that. Somebody that knows the machine, knows what they're looking for, knows what the, the problems are, will have to write that documentation. That might mean an engineer for a couple of days. Is it worth it? Is it worth paying an engineer for two days to write good documentation my guys can then apply and minimise human error? I think it is. But um, each company has to make that choice for themselves. But there's an answer. The answer's there, has been there. Well, this goes back to the 1950s, 1960s. That table is, is that old. Been around for 50 years. So yes, we have an answer in that table. We have some, the what to do is to simplify things, to make things clear for our brains, to give our brains information to work with. You know? Pass, fail, yes, no. Very clear, defined criteria. And you will create fewer problems. You will save human error. Now, this is the world we live in. <clears throat> we have machines that are a series arrangement of parts. Every single part has to be incredibly reliable maintained and operated by people who are failure prone, who are error prone. And this is why maintenance and reliability is so hard in companies. I don't know, you know, if that fails, if my lubrication fails, my machine fails. If my bearing fails, my machine fails. There is so much we have to get right. And this is the challenge that we're facing across the world. So many things to go wrong, of which um, there are so many ways to make them go wrong, yeah, we've got to find one process where things do not go wrong. That's been solved. Boeing have shown us what to do. Build a process that produces the same results every single time, no matter who runs that process. So I want to take Boeing's thinking, uh, the Airbus thinking, uh, and apply that to all our machines because they're all built the same way. A long string of things that can go wrong with people that can make things go wrong unintentionally. And I've got to solve those problems. Now, this one here, lubrication, is interesting. Now, lubrication, I put it up there on purpose. In a bearing, lubrication appears twice in this chain of, of components. And lubrication is a component in the, in the machine. So if I have lubrication that is uh, of poor quality, of, of contamination, because it appears twice, I've got two places for that lubrication to fail the machine. If I've got a gearbox with many teeth and many bearings and many shafts, I've got thousands of places for that lubrication to fail the machine. So 
Lubrication management is vital for mechanical equipment because there are so many places that one little particle contaminant can destroy the machine. So to me, lubrication management is probably the number one thing any company with machinery should focus on because that one problem appears thousands of times across their business and it has many opportunities to, to fail their machines. As it says, uh, one fails, all fails, you know, one poor, all poor, because it's a serious arrangement. And I want to play with some numbers again because uh, it, it, it gives you some, it leads us on to some answers. Playing with the numbers leads us on to some answers. Here I've got a 12-step process. My, my man up here is doing his maintenance job. It has 12 activities. And I say, you know, what if? What if 10 of these activities are perfect and only two of these have a chance of one error in, in 10? So 0.9 reliability. Now, I've got to be careful here. This reliability, not the same reliability as it is with machinery. This is a chance of, of an error, which isn't the same as a, as a, as a chance of failure. Failure, uh, an error, does not necessarily go to failure. If I make a mistake, it doesn't mean I will actually break something. Uh, it means there's a chance that mistake will lead to a breakdown, but it doesn't mean it will actually happen. So this reliability I, I talk about here is the chance of success, success in these tasks, not the same reliability as a machine reliability. Nonetheless, we can play with the numbers because the message is still pretty clear. Here we go, my 12-step process, two of which I have 90% reliability. The chance of the whole system being done right is 0.81. So about 100 times this job is done, 81 times right, 19 times it'll fail on these two steps. So I'll be a bit pessimistic now. Let's talk about maintenance. This middle one here, talk about maintenance. Maintenance is, I'll say, one chance in 10 of going wrong at each task. I've got 12 tasks. Each one is 90% success. The chance of, of, of a whole job going right is 0.28. Out of 100 times this job is done, 28 times right, and 72 times it'll go wrong. In one of these steps, it affects the whole outcome of the job. Then I say, gee, what if I can go from 0.9 to 0.99? Yeah. The more nines in a row, the better. So here I go. If I, can, if I can do that, if I can get all 12 at 0.99, my chance of the whole job being done right is now 0.98. So 98 times out of 100, it'll be done right. So it says to me, not knowing what to do, but if I can create that, if I can go from 0.9 to 0.99, then I will produce many more jobs that are done right the machines are now maintained properly, run properly, rebuilt properly many more times. That will pay back with uptime and availability and more throughput to the company. So the question is now, what do I have to do to go from 0.9 to 0.99? Because whatever that is, I want to know that. I don't care how small it is or how big it is. Every single step in the right direction, I want to grab. Now we have um, an interesting example of what's been done in industry before. The Carpenter's Creed, measure twice, cut once. Now, you know, previous time I was a bricklayer for a few years and of course you come across carpenters from time to time in bricklaying. So I picked up that creed well in, in, the, in the early stages of my, of my career. Didn't mean much to me until the day came when I said, well, how do you turn 0.9? How do you turn 0.9 into 0.99? And then the thought, well, what, what, what do carpenters mean? Well, obviously, they mean a double check. Yeah? Second measurement's a double check on the first. So I said, let's not do that check. Let's just see what it means if we just do one measurement. Go back to the human error rate table. One measurement is uh, 0.99, 0.995 reliable. Five times in a thousand, you'll misread the tape measure, basically, is what it says. Well, five in a thousand is the same as one in 200. So a carpenter, you can imagine a carpenter cutting his piece of you know, measuring, cutting, measuring, cutting 40, 50, 50 times a day. So on average, about once a week, because the carpenter misreads, he will scrap the job. He'll mark it in the wrong place, cut it, and say, ah, damn, this is not going to work for us, and toss it away. But the advice is, measure twice. So I do. Let's model what that means. What they're saying is, do a double check on your first measurement. So now, if I do a double check, I'm actually doing a parallel activity. I'm double checking this arrangement here. Yeah, I measure once and measure twice. So they are done in series. But the logic, the reliability block diagram of that logic is a parallel activity. I'm double checking my first measurement. Now this measurement too can be done wrong. I'm using the same tape measure, it can be done wrong. But once I have a double check on my original task, my reliability of that activity of a series of two, I've got to do two things wrong now, one after the other, much less likely. I'm down to one in 5,000. So I've gone from one in 200 
to one in 5,000. So from once a week to once in every 20 weeks. And all I've done is do a double check. I haven't got anything else. I haven't bought new machinery. I haven't gone out and done some training. I've simply introduced a double check. And in doing that, I've gone from once a week to once every six months, every five months in errors. So that's what the carpenters have given us that advice. My question is, is why stop there? Can you pick up the wrong piece of wood and mark the wrong piece of wood? Of course you can. Can you mark the wood in a, in a, in a bad way? Instead of marking it square at a cross at an angle of one or two degrees, you can't pick up with your eyes. It can happen. Can I cut the wood and actually destroy the wood as I'm cutting with a badly sharpened saw, for example? Sure. So to me, just double checking the measurement isn't enough. But the thinking's right. This double check creates huge decrease in error. And that thinking should apply at every single process step because it works. And all that is is a double check. And when you come to lean manufacturing, you look at some of the techniques they use in lean manufacturing, what they do is introduce a protection on the first activity. They make sure that certain things are done you know, with a checklist or they'll colour code things or they'll mark things in a way where the marking indicates the problem. So yeah, we can introduce the concept of twice cut once thinking, the parallel activity of another independent inspection uh, on our tasks. And if we can do that, we create these outcomes. Less and less error. So there we go. I've actually gone and done that. I've said, OK, well, here's my original 0.9 accuracy. And I've put a measurement step in there. And typically, a measurement step is a high reliability step because they're measuring with you know, instrumentation. We're actually working to define criteria, define points. And there are eight measurements, much, much less. So now I've got my task one and task two system and task three system and task four system. When I apply the mathematics of that, I come down to uh, an outcome of 0 0.99, 0 0.999. So a reliability now of that five task job being done is with double check activities is five times in 10,000. Oh, sorry, five times in a thousand error. 995 times out of a thousand it'll be done right. So I've now found a way to turn an error-prone situation into parallel activities where there is far less chance of, of mistakes. Not perfect. It's not impossible to make a mistake here, but far less likely. And all because the Carpenter's Creed makes it very, very clear. So now I've turned my 0.9 process into a 0.99 process. And all I've done is add in another 10 seconds on that task and a double check with my, with my measuring device. I've got to make sure I cover off a one thing here. This inspection, this double check, should be independent of your first device. So I'm going to use one device to do my first measurement, this one here. To be sure that I do the right thing by this process, I should get a second device that is independent of this. Because if this device is actually incorrect, if it's a, a micrometer, for example, a micrometer's out of calibration, if I use the same micrometer to measure the second check, then because it's an error in the micrometer, it will give me the same error in the second check. So if I have, if I have micrometers, then they've got to be calibrated. I've got to believe in the calibration. I've got to know they're right. Because if I then use that same micrometer device a second time to prove this one was right and the micrometer's wrong, I'll measure the same measurement twice. Both are the same number, but they're both wrong. So the right way to do this second check is independent of the first. Typically with a second micrometer or a second tape measure or a second ruler. Just so that any common cause error that's in here, that common cause does not flow across all the measurements and all the results. Otherwise that common cause failure will appear across all the activities. We'll think it's right because of course we trust the measurement device and we believe what the numbers tell us, but the numbers are wrong because the device is wrong. So yeah, watch out for that. Uh, the principle's correct. Parallel activities will produce fewer failures and fewer errors, but we have to be sure that that second check is also correct. Ideally, of course, we'd like to have every single activity perfect. And there is a, a technique which we call error proofing, and that's a big factor of lean, and, and lean solutions are part of plant wellness as well. 
I don't want to reinvent, or nobody wants to reinvent the wheel. Now, if something's working well in a particular technique, just going to adopt that directly into its use. So a lot of the lean philosophies are great. We're just going to take those on board because they're already proven to work. One of them is error proofing. Now error proofing does not mean no human error because human beings always make mistakes. What error proofing says is that when a mistake is made, it is found and corrected before it becomes a, a failure. So this number one, these, these ones here, does not mean we don't make an error. It means that the error is detected, corrected, so that the actual task step is right. And what they're doing now is uh, designing machines that go together one way. Now, I build a machine in one way, if I put the part in incorrectly, it can't be rebuilt. So it doesn't matter if I put the part in incorrectly because I'm a human being and I'm tired and I want to go home because I need to sleep from the party last night. That's okay, the machine protects itself because it can only go together in one way. So yeah, this concept of error proofing, we can take the philosophy of recognising a mistake before it becomes a breakdown, correcting that and making it right uh, into our activities that we do in maintenance in particular and operations as well, of course. So no, we human beings are never going to be perfect, but the processes we use can produce perfect results.